Tiana Koto, welcome everyone. I hope, oh, hello, there's extra familiar faces in the audience. It's exciting. Um, I hope you all had a lovely little lunch break and you're feeling refreshed and energized. Um, there was a lot of really awesome stuff covered this morning, so that uh, sets the bar quite high. Um, so, what am I going to chat with you about today? So, my name's H, and I wear kind of two hats as I stand to chat with you today. Um, in my daytime hat that I wear is as the Education Director at Rainbow Youth. So I get to work with our education team in schools, um, delivering sexuality and gender diversity workshops, as well as professional development workshops for um, organisations and higher learning. Um, but the other hat that I'm wearing, and the work that I'm going to be speaking about today, is my master's research. Um, and I just kind of want to share a little bit about my journey kind of going through that stuff because you know it's all online you can download it and read it um, but something that I'm really excited about being in this space today is having the opportunity um, uh -huh. That's great, You're sweet of me, um, is having the opportunity um, to kind of share some of the, uh, the shared nuances of um, doing any kind of work that represents our community and often you know, we, have, we, it's, we stand in two camps, one foot in our community and one in the academy. And we're having to do community development and education to the academy and then trying to translate all this academic stuff to see if it lines up with what's actually happening in our community. And that tension and that dance um, can put a lot of pressure on um, us as researchers. So I think I'll put in a few little anecdotes along the way that didn't quite make it into the written record of um, my journey. Awesome. So to start off, I just really want to acknowledge the different people that I bring with me into this space. This is a wee picture of some of my whānau. That's my, um, my gran who left school at 14 and then at the age of 23 with a baby and newly married decided let's go live in New Zealand um, with that, you know, all of those hopes and dreams of, um, that, you know, that that was being offered to them. Um, so they made a bit of a radical journey because they wanted to change the course of what um, their whānau could look like in a new space. So I just really want to um, acknowledge them and the, um, the journey that they've came on that's allowed me to be here today um, talking about um, studying at a university level. Cool. So my master's research, the fancy title was Investigating the Role of Collaborative Arts Practice in Generating Self-Representational Genderqueer Narratives. And I thought, I thought, cool, so when we're doing this presentation today, like, where do we start? Like, which bit do I bring you in on? So I thought I'd go right back to the very beginning. I've always loved storytelling and getting all my favourite people around to tell and share stories, um, whether they be true or made up or... Um, and to fully express themselves. Um, this is a picture of me and my best friend Katie Kerr growing up, um, having a, a little cordial with our um, teddy bears one afternoon. And I think that that just really sums up, my art practice still looks like this. Um, and I really acknowledge that the creative work that we do doesn't happen in isolation. And in the same way, our identity formation stuff doesn't happen in isolation either. So hopefully I'll try and weave those two, um, those two stories together on the journey that we'll go through today. Awesome. So I've always been um, a creative person. Um, I always, when I reflect back on my schooling and my education, um, the two times that I've done really well in education were at preschool, like I was the top scone maker and the best, you know, cutter upper of bits of paper and sticking them together. Um, the school bit in between didn't really work so well for me. In year 12, I successfully failed maths, English, biology, and history. Um, so, to, and then started university, and all of a sudden, I felt like, Ah, oh, I'm in a place where the, the kind of clever that I have um, is able to be recognised and seen and um, I'm able to explore things in the language that I have, which is the language of making. Um, awesome. So that kind of brings us to where we are now. Um, so after a few years out in the real world, after finishing my Bachelor of Design um, up the road at AUT, um, I did it under the fashion department. I came back and started my um, postgraduate journey um, at AUT. For my honours research, I was really interested in how do we create, how do we tell stories about the most intimate parts about ourselves? What is that? What is that? Um, and I, through academic investigation, found this, this fancy term called self-representational narratives. I thought, woohoo, awesome. Um, 
And so I kind of set out on a journey, and my research question for my honours year was asking, is it possible to develop a means of self-representational narrative that engages with issues of misrepresentation and invisibility of gender minorities in Auckland? Um, I did this project as a, as a kind of a personal journey as well, in terms of exploring my own identity um, within that space. Um, but the conclusions that I came to at the end of my honours work was, cool, I've done all this stuff and I've done performances about my identity, I've made zines and I've done these exhibitions and I've written these sort of very emo poems and I've stamped them and you know, graffitied them everywhere. Um, but you know, and that's been a really beautiful and incredible experience for me, and I've had all these reflections. But can we, can we extend the scope of this kind of, this, this research field or this field of inquiry um, to bring in other people of similar identities? Um, would there be a way of walking alongside each other that could better support each other with some of the challenges that I found in doing my own project? Um, and then that's where kind of my master, um, the title for my master's was born. So this was me sort of, this is my reflecting photo, like, ah, we've done all this thing, what next? Um, also, I like it as an image of design thinking. It's like, there's no chairs. Okay, I'll go have like a really comfortable desk to sit on. Awesome. So, starting my master's year, my question was, how can collaborative arts practice be effectively used to support the generation of self-representational gender queer narratives? So I, okay, became increasingly aware that, the, that a lot of the narratives we have in our community, whether they be um, stories we tell each other, um, representations in books and movies, are often around, are often around binary, binary trans identities. Um, and that didn't relate to my own um, experience of my own gender identity. Um, so I've brought in the scope of this project to look um, specifically at non-binary identities. And for the course of this research project, I use the word genderqueer. I probably have a whole bunch of other words that I would now use to describe myself, but for the purpose of this, um, that's the language that I used. So some of the theoretical and contextual frameworks um, the audiences here will be um, really familiar with. Um, and the first theoretical framework that I you know, started to flesh out as I started to write my thesis and explore um, this field of inquiry was a concept of gender pluralism. So that just basically means that there's more than two, two binary identities, that there's space in between and that gender is limitless um, and looks different across a lot of different spaces. Now that, in this audience, is I hopefully just an assumed given, like, oh yeah, cool, now let's do the work. But this, I probably spent about 65% of my year trying to explore this and convey this effectively um, to those around me in my department um, and in other universities as well when I was presenting at conferences. Um, so I think, yeah, that was just a really interesting reflection that I wanted to share today that when we're talking about identity stuff that we're experts in um, and we're translating that into the language of the academy, we can find that language. If it's, if it's not there, we create it. But the the powers that be, that police some of that stuff um, within the academy can be really, um, can be really suffocating of new and interesting um, research. Um, I was looking at um, non-binary gender identities, again, that misrepresentation and invisibility just more generally of gender minorities within pop culture, um, self-representational narratives, my favourite method of inquiry. Um, and I started to look at, when I started to think about the methodology and the how, um, looking at this term collaborative arts practice, um, particularly looking at its roots within other minority identities, particularly some of our ethnic minorities um, and faith-based expressions of identity. And then, then a question that started to develop over the course of that research project was, well, could a collective identity be formed? Is that dangerous? Do we want to steer away from it? Do we want to use a collective as a space, for, uh, as a space to recharge and energise, but then are we trying to create one version of what it is to be this, so then are we policing that? So those are some of the um, questions and thoughts we had um, on our journey. Um, I promise there's lots of pictures. I'm just going to talk about the wordy stuff first. Um, so for my um, research designer methodology, um, when I came across this concept of a research whānau, it totally rocked my socks. Because um, before this, I was like, OK, I'm going to use an action-based research, cycles of reflection in and on action. Um, but I was like, oh, how do I explain that I don't want to be like this researcher studying these people? Like, I want to 
this collaboration needs to happen where the people that I'm working with inside are just as equal and important and valid as my own. Um, so yeah, employ this research Fano methodology, which was yeah, which is awesome and um, life changing. Cool. My recruitment was just was I think I called it. I had a really good. Um, I had a really good turn. I used a snowball recruitment method, and we ended up with um, six participants in this project, and two pulled out. So I'll um, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, action research, learning by doing. Um, all of the participants kept sketchbooks and journals along our um, journey, and they they um, formed part of the data analysis at the end of the project. Um, and I managed to get ethics approval to do a project involving vulnerable participants. Awesome. So with our four participants, um, we set about on a journey to, to ask, could we create works that talked about our identity in a public way, in a public exhibition? Um, what would that journey be like? How would our identities weave and intersect with each other? Um, and then, yeah, then what kind of reflections would we have on either the good ways we did that or the ways to improve that for you know, kind of creating like a, a good practice among um, uh, gender diversity creative practitioners um, moving forward. Um, so this on the left was a poster for um, the exhibition that we held a couple of years ago and the tagline for it was Queer Encounters and Mixed Magics, a collective exploration of taking up space, playing games and incoherent genderliciousness, which I think was just absolutely fabulous. Awesome. Um, and some of our participants chose to um, engage in the project anonymously and some with their full names published. So, um, right there. so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the cool stuff we made together um, and what that was like for us. Um, and then I'll um, get into the data and our analysis and our findings. Um, so the picture on the left was our first, our first go at making stuff together. Because we've got four very different people who come from very different disciplines. We had a performance artist, a writer, a comic artist, and me who's kind of done stuff within sculpture and textile. So we're very different in, in our fields of, um, in our practice, but in terms of like our shared sense of whānau to and with each other, we're all known to each other. Um, and then, yeah, so how do we start to weave that together? Um, so we had this idea that we're just like string a whole bunch of different um, different pieces of um, calico from the roof um, in test space. And we just kind of went nuts with um, uh, bubble solution and dye pigment. And it was really, it, was a, it gave us a real opportunity to move with each other. We put music on, some people took their clothes off, others didn't, I kept mine on, because I was the student at the university and I didn't want to get expelled. Um, and so we were like, let's just see kind of what happens. And there was um, one of the participants is, um, you know, who's our performance artist, you know, moves with their body really interestingly. And they went along all of these pieces of, of fabric and made all these tiny little dots. And others would kind of make a line. And then I've got the um, dyed paper and mix it up with the bubbles and I was blowing bubbles onto it. And then I was like, oh, this isn't making it bigger mark. So I just started splashing it on. So all of us, you know, moved and worked in a different way, but we were kind of learning how to move with um, with and around each other. Um, we then pressed and steamed and hung them in really interesting ways um, in the exhibition. And people were like, oh, these are incredible. It's like literally we just like threw paint at fabric and it wasn't actually about the product, but it was about the process um, together. And in our um, focus group um, at the end of the project, that was um, one of the reflections that we had that that was a really great tool um, to, to get us moving and working with each other. Awesome. This next piece is Queer Twister. Um, so Lady J. Laurie had this great idea that oh, playing Twist is awesome and you're, you know, it's quite a, a physical experience getting to know each other and, and bodies and identities and all of that because you're all sweaty and you know, whatever. And it often happens in private spaces in the home. So we thought, let's go play Twister in a park, film it and see what happens. Um, but we were like, we're gonna do Twister with a difference. Um, so we had a, a spin board with all these different sort of catchphrases that we might hear in our community. Um, so when it spun to that one, it would be like, left foot meets the queen, right elbow, friend of Dorothy, you know. So it was this kind of queering um, Twister, also in doing it in public space. 
all four of us are pretty um, can at different times in the way we move in different spaces. We're quite gender non-conforming or gender challenging sometimes in our presentation. You know, like people sometimes, I've got a funny haircut to start with, you know, like people look at us. And so we were doing this in a very public space with music, we were being silly. Um, and so we had all sorts of people approach and join in. We had some like backpackers who were actually yoga instructors and it just got a little wild. Um, and so we filmed this and we, um, we, and we sped it up and put this sort of silly circus music over the top and we um, showed that as one of the, um, as one of the pieces in our um, public exhibition. Awesome. Our next piece was um, by Charlie Horse, and we got this large piece of, um, of paper. It would have been about, it's probably about six metres long by two metres high. We pinned it to the wall, and as um, guests came into the exhibition, um, they were asked a question um, by Joey there, and the question was, um, tell us a word that describes your gender, or how do you do gender, or what word do you think of when you hear the word gender? So Joey would come and tell Charlie Horse about this word, and then Charlie would sort of, sort of nod, take their, um, they had a one bucket of resin black high gloss paint and a roller, would dip it in there, and then perform the word. <laughs> so at the start of the evening, we had this blank canvas, and by the end of the evening, we had this um, quite outrageous um, a mural, which is really quite incredible. But again, talking about how do we weave in different understandings of a really complex experience and that no two people's experience is the same. So um, it was a really fun, it was a really fun way to also, not only a collaborative process between Joey and Charlie and then us supporting, but also collaborative in its inclusion of the participants were the artists or the muse. Um, our dear friend Sam Orchard, um, who's a comic artist, he did a live, um, he was the live installation. Um, so he, he started off a comic that kind of went along this wall, um, exploring, you know, what does gender mean to him and what does that look like, how does that feel? And then he, as he kind of observed people observing all of these really quite big and intense um, pieces of work, um, made some more observations about the gendered way we live and be in the world. And so he was a comic in residence, um, and he put panels up as the, as the night progressed. That was his little spot there, um, which was really cool. And then he then um, went on and published that online, so I was stoked. Awesome. And then my work that I um, did in in um, collaboration and consultation with the group, but the way that um, I wanted to express a narrative in this exhibition was um, looking at looking at this looking at the skin that we're in. Um, that can be a really complex experience for a lot of different people, um, because often sometimes the skin that we're in doesn't necessarily represent the person that we feel like we are in a lot of different ways. Um, so I was looking at that um, from a gendered perspective, um, but also taking aesthetic and visual inspiration from um, the animal world and looking at other animals that shed skins as a way of, as a, as a moment in their journey, either through trauma or coming of age and stuff like that. And so I yeah, was exploring um, these ideas of like chrysalises and or like, um, you know, like uh, when bugs leave behind their shell and it's kind of see-through, but it still, it still has the memory of what was in it. Um, so I was playing around with a non-normative body or expression of a body. So I was, um, the kind of shapes and bodices that I made for this project and that were then like hung from the ceiling were, were of a pregnant male torso. Um, and it caused a bit of drama in my department as you know everyone sometimes in the fashion department you might pad out certain parts of the body to make it fit the model that you're working with you know they want larger breasts or they're not quite so thin in the middle and whereas I was you know putting a pregnant belly on a male torso and they just thought oh what's H up to again mm. Another idea that I was playing around with, yeah, with these ideas of skins and parts that are shed, you know, these really beautiful crystals, these really beautiful um, shells that they're just kind of left to kind of blow off in the wind. What happens to them? They do tell a story. There's still um, stuff embedded in them. So I was looking at, yeah, combining some of this stuff. I don't know if you can tell um, in this shot, but I made um, five different cases, um, five different manifestations of a pregnant belly and then a big hunched back through the back. 
and the back was cast in resin, um, so it, it crunched and um, was like yeah, an insect skin that had been left behind. And the front was this really beautiful um, organza, but was, was falling in a shape that shouldn't fall for a male body. Um, and then they were covered in various developments with these um, creations. Awesome. So we made lots of art and we showed it and it was really fun and we got to explore ourselves and talk to our loved ones about what we had made. Um, but then we had to gather the data and reflect on that and wondered, could we develop a collective narrative? Was that ethical? And then what, you know, what would the, um, the focus group um, findings tell us? So our focus group discussion, we did, um, now I've got, a, I've got the academic word to tell you what we did. We did a, yeah, we, we used um, an open-ended discussion to prompt, um, to prompt feedback that wasn't, um, yeah, that wasn't kind of biased in any way. Um, we had an external facilitator come in, and again, we reaffirmed um, my position as just a participant, not as researcher when we were doing, when we were gathering this data. And so, some of the findings were what I thought they would be, and some were not. So, um, key findings from this research, and I did um, a phenomenological um, thematic analysis of the um, of the findings. So our first one was that participants felt vulnerable in making art about their diverse gender identity for public exhibition and felt vulnerable expressing this identity with each other. We could probably all um, you know, guess that that might be the case. Um, specifically, our participants felt that their identity would face tough scrutiny from other gender diverse guests at the exhibition, which I think is a really interesting um, point to highlight whenever we're talking about anything to do with collective identity, we become almost the polices of that identity. Um, we saw it in some of the trans healthcare um, consultation stuff, all of a sudden you're bringing together our community to say what our needs are, and it's like, well, well, no, these needs are more important, or that's not really our need, like, what does that look like? Our second key finding was that focusing on the process of making with each other, rather than on an outcome for a specific task, so rather than saying, we're gonna do an exhibition, make some art, it's like, well, we're gonna have an exhibition, but we're gonna, make, we're gonna go on a journey and we're gonna make some stuff together, and it might end up in an exhibition. Um, that this process allowed participants um, in the space to get to know each other better, and in turn, end up, ended up feeling safer about discussing their, um, their identity with each other which is awesome. Um, our participants felt that there was a layer of fluidity in the project that mirrored the narrative of their own fluidity um, in terms of their identity and within the exhibition. And this was a positive experience for participants. And this was something that I was really nervous about because when you're doing something within the confines of um, whether it be for a funder or within an institution or within an organisation or within some certain other rules or um, governing things, um, it's really hard to say, but we need to be true to our community and the things that work for us, but we need to also make this fit within this construct. So um, I'm glad that they did experience a layer of fluidity because I felt that it was very restrictive, so that was good. Um, and our fourth finding that participants felt that the experience of working in a collaborative set setting on work centred in their shared identity um, enhanced their creative practice. And I definitely reflect on this one as well, that I felt, I felt safe enough to finally make the work that I'd been wanting to make, um, which is, yeah, an absolute breakthrough moment um, for me. Cool. So I then reflected on these findings in relation to my own experience, both of the project and of my postgraduate um, journey, and in the development of my own personal creative practice through this time. Um, yeah. So if I was to think about that vulnerabilities, um, addressing this vulnerability in the, the methodology, the research design and my ethics application um, was, really, was really important to me. Um, and I was terrified that I hadn't done enough work in this area. So um, these, the focus group findings gave me some good things to reflect on for future projects. Um, but all of the work that I had done was appreciated in different ways um, in that reflection. So. Um, even though it was a lot of work at the beginning to set up um, uh, assessing what people need to make them feel safe in that space, um, assessing 
other barriers or restrictions um, and finding ways to work around them. Um, doing all that work in the beginning allowed us to just get on with doing the thing, which is awesome. Um, and the safety thing as well. I was petrified about talking about the stuff within my university. Like I talk about the stuff in my community out there, but then taking the stuff um, into a university setting um, was terrifying for me. Um, but I felt a real collective strength of the group, um, and that helped me to be more confident in, in my work. Um, there was this one quote that I said in the focus group that I think kind of sums up my experience of the project. And I have to excuse my um, slightly not so academic language when I say this. I don't know if it's just the experience of being with your people or finally having space that you can just breathe a little and not feel like a tightly spun rubber band like I usually am in creative environments or how I have to be in the world to survive. It was just, I was able to kind of unwind a little bit and within that, my creative practice was able to loosen up and flow a bit as well. Yeah. Which I thought was really, um, if, I hadn't, if I hadn't had the opportunity to stop and reflect on that, I would have just said, oh, that was a cool thing, and now on to the next highly, highly wound up um, creative project. So um, this has really challenged, challenged what my practice looks like um, and has also given me some signposts about what I need in my um, creative practice to continue to make awesome things. So the, the age-old question that anyone asks you when you finish um, a body of work is, where to next? Um, I think this project, while it was a means to an end in some respects, I got my Masters of Art and Design, which is cool. Um, it's really ignited a new understanding of the power of collaborative storytelling within minority communities. Um, and it's really solidified for me in a personal way my commitment to making sure or to, to creating spaces where those stories can be told um, and also creating spaces where that can be done in a safe way and in a way that grows that person. Um, so it's not, we're not um, pillaging people's stories for the advancement of the cause. We're creating spaces where people can share their stories for them and as a flow on effect, the community and the world might change. Yeah. Um, where to next? Further study, hopefully one day. If anyone wants to give me a scholarship, that would be great. Um, but watch the space because I think, yeah, this is just the beginning. And thank you so much to Jen um, for organising and um, having me here today.